Good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce Tom Ganiadek for um, the Grand Round speaker today. Dr. Ganiadek came to us from Johns Hopkins, but he began his medical career um, or his career in general as a um, student at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. Tom got his Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry at Yale. He went on to get his PhD, um, and his doctoral dissertation was Computational Methods for Studying the Early Secretory Pathway in Trypanosoma brucei. He began his work at Yale, but his advisor moved to Vienna, Austria, where Tom followed and um, got to live for, I think, two years and finish up his PhD. He then returned to Yale for his MD, and then moved to Johns Hopkins to do his APCP residency. Our um, dean, Brooks Jackson, was chairman at the time, and so he knows Tom well. Um, while he was at Hopkins, he won a number of awards. He won the uh, Research Award as Pathology Young Investigators Day. He won the Eggleston Award for Surgical Pathology. He won the Quality Improvement in Patient Safety Award and he won the Frank Colson Jr. Award for Clinical e Excellence <coughs> and the Research Award for Pathology Young Investigators Day twice, one in 2013, one in 2016. So he came to us um, well recommended by Brooks, and we've done very well with Tom. He's um, an excellent clinical fellow. He is passionate about his patients. He came to us with more research publications than peer-reviewed research publications than several faculty. He has 15 already in some outstanding journals. Tom also has um, skills in the IT world. He was a clinical researcher and software consultant for companies in, um, in and around New Haven, Connecticut, and has helped us tremendously as a result during his time as a fellow. Today, Dr. Ganiadek will be talking about pathogen-reduced platelets, a paradigm shift. Thank you, Claudia. That was very kind. I have control already. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. And the objectives today are really to talk about platelets in general, and then the risks and regulatory push for pathogen-reduced platelet products. I'm going to go over a little bit the pathogen-reduced technologies, both preclinical and clinical data, and then talk about some of the alternatives and the pros and cons to pathogen reduction. So where do platelets come from? Well, if you're a hospitalized patient, there's this magical tree that platelets seem to grow on. Uh, it shakes and it lives at room temperature in the blood bank. Um, but seriously, over the years, things have changed a little bit in the United States. Um, it used to be that we got most of our platelets from whole blood donations that were spun, and then the essentially platelet-rich plasma was pooled from multiple donations. We've since gone over to single donor platelets collected by apheresis. Advantages of single donor platelets are pretty compelling. You don't have to do the pooling, obviously. Um, there's fewer exposures, and so, you know, obviously after the AIDS epidemic and now with Zika, you're not exposed to five different people, uh, you're exposed to one. And then if one of those donors were to have an issue, we have something in blood banking called a look back, which is sort of a frustrating experience. Um, so basically if someone donates blood and then they call the blood center a month later and say, you know, I said I never was exposed to someone else's blood, or I said I never took IV drugs, but it turns out that I did. Then you have to go look back and see who got the blood products from that donor and try to figure out if they're at risk and if they need testing. Kind of annoying when you multiply everything by five or six. Um, and then the other advantage of single donor platelets is that the apheresis machine can do leukocyte reduction while it's collecting. And so the product itself, from the point that it's made, is leukocyte reduced. Because you only stick a person's skin once, you end up with fewer septic transfusion reactions from the apheresis products. And it's easier to do cross-matching and HLA matching. And so this has to do with the fact that if someone receives multiple transfusions, they eventually might develop antibodies against foreign epitopes, so non-self 
uh, and typically it's against HLA molecules. When they develop those antibodies and then subsequently get transfused from people who have the same epitopes that they have antibodies to, the platelets are rapidly cleared in the spleen and essentially, we think, have no function. If that happens to your patient, and unfortunately it happens here quite a bit because our oncology patients receive many transfusions, you then need to find donors who either have the same HLA type as the recipient or have HLA types uh, for which the recipient does not have antibodies. That's much easier if you're just finding one person as opposed to five or six. And then, of course, there are fewer contaminating red cells in the apheresis collected product. And so, for instance, you don't need to give Rogam uh, if you give someone uh, an RHD positive platelet. So really, what I think of as the last paradigm shift in blood banking occurred in the early 2000s. It's when the argument in favor of leukocyte reduction um, and, and essentially going to single donor apheresis platelets tipped the scales. Um, we stopped pooling platelets and we basically shifted 100% to apheresis collections. And what's interesting, so this is from Yale, the rate of febrile transfusion reactions prior to that switch, you know, was actually pretty high. I mean, we're talking like two to six percent of people are having a fever when they get transfused. And now you have leukocyte reduced products from the apheresis machine and you've cut your febrile reaction rate not quite to zero, but by almost an order of magnitude. The apheresis platforms for uh, platelet collection basically come from two companies in the United States, Fenwall and Terumo. Um, they're big machines. The donors that do this, uh, God bless them, I don't know exactly what compels people to do this, but you sit there, typically you have two needles, uh, one in each arm, one pulls into the machine, the machine spins your blood, takes off the platelets, and then sends the rest back to you. That whole process can take up to two hours where people are basically sitting there uh, doing their donation. And you can donate about 24 times a year. And so a lot, a lot of these donors do. They come every two weeks. Platelet testing is essentially the same right now as for donating red cells. So you do uh, standard donor infectious disease testing but you also have to come into parameters in terms of the concentration of platelets and the volume of the product that you collect. The AABB, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, uh, has also said that you need measures to detect and limit bacterial contamination on all platelet components. And unlike red cells, this is really an issue because platelets are stored at room temperature. People have tried storing platelets at four degrees. It works in a sense, they don't explode and disappear, um, but there are changes to the surface of the platelets um, so that when they're transfused, they're rapidly cleared from circulation. There's some question right now as to whether those cold storage platelets that are rapidly cleared are actually more active in a sense of going to a site of injury or a site of bleeding and actually doing something good. Um, and trials are ongoing and, and being prepared. But at this point, we're essentially storing all our platelets at room temperature for five days, which is the perfect environment for bacterial growth. We also agitate them, and that's so that they don't clump and settle. And we put them in special breathable bags uh, to keep their metabolism happy. In terms of the storage solution, there's right now essentially two options. One is just pure plasma from the donor, and the other is a buffer called platelet additive solution. The additive solution replaces about two-thirds of the plasma. Because you have less plasma, you have lower rates of allergic transfusion reactions, which are thought to be due to allergens or non-self antigens in the donor plasma for the most part. Um, and people have also questioned whether there's lower rates of trolley, transfusion-associated lung injury, which is thought to be due to passively transfused donor antibodies that maybe stimulate neutrophils in the lungs of um, at-risk recipients. So by cutting down the amount of plasma that you're giving, you're cutting down the amount of passively transfused antibodies. There's obviously different formulations of platelet additive solution. I think right now we're mostly using PASS-3. Um, and as far as I can tell, it's approved uh, for the machine of the company that makes it, which is Fenwall. Um, interestingly, if you spike a unit with bacteria, and it's a pass unit, 
the bacteria tend not to form a biofilm compared to a unit that's pure plasma. And maybe because they're not in a biofilm, they're sort of floating free, uh, they grow better, and there's more rapid detection of the bacteria. The other thing to note about platelet additive solution is that you pay for it. So, regulatory and risk, which is unfortunately or not a lot of what we do in blood banking. The FDA, we all know, is responsible for protecting the public health by assuring safety, efficacy, and security of human and veterinary drugs and biological products. Within the FDA, there's a Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, or CBER. CBER's mission is to essentially the same, protect and advance the public health by ensuring that biological products are safe and effective and available for those who need them. Just as a sort of aside, uh, the current deputy director is Peter Marks, who was the head of Yale's Cancer <coughs> Center um, a while back. And it's interesting because if you're in transfusion medicine and you run a blood bank, all your software has to be FDA approved. And if you want to make a single change, and I know people in AP think they have it hard with software, but if you want to make one single change to your software product, you need to get approval from the FDA. Yeah. Now, you can maybe do that if you are at Yale and you know Peter Marks personally, uh, which some people do. So in terms of infectious agent risk, there's an interesting graph I pulled here. It's public perception on the y-axis, so how risky, versus what science is telling us and epidemiology is telling us. Now, we all know that if you're uh, a hospitalized patient and you don't have much of an immune system and I transfuse you a unit of red cells that have Babesia in them, uh, you're not going to do so well. So the risk is, is very high. And, and the public sort of thinks, well, you know, that's not too bad. Nobody really gets Babesia. You know, that's not, not really a major problem. Um, on the other hand, if you look at things like um, you know, Lyme disease, the theoretical risk is very low of transmission, and, and the public sort of has that, that same perception. Um, this, this sort of real risk versus perceived risk, um, and I hate to say it because obviously the FDA tries to go on data, but these two vectors are driving most of the regulatory uh, environment in blood banking. So if you look at transfusion-related fatalities, and this is, in my opinion, what we should be interested in, Transfusion-associated lung injury, or at least the cases that are thought to be due to uh, donor antibodies that then stimulate neutrophils in the recipient and lead to lung injury, are probably the number one in terms of pure numbers. And this is going from 2009 to 2013. But then, you know, you sort of have a smattering. The next up is TACO, which is circulatory overload by transfusion. Um, very common, probably under-recognized. Um, and then, of course, you have microbial infection, which has been sort of a pesky little area of, uh, of mortality because it sort of doesn't go away. And there's not much we can do, we think. There's a lot of risk modifiers for those microbial infections. So there's donor-specific factors, obviously, if the donor has an infection, um, or if they have asymptomatic bacteremia. Um, there's production factors, so there's contamination from the skin of the donor um, or during processing. There's also issues that could occur with infectious disease testing where you essentially miss uh, infections. And then, of course, there are recipient factors, which matter a lot. So if you transfuse a small load of bacteria into someone who's on a ton of antibiotics, hopefully not much will happen. Um, of course, with viruses, there's a question of prior vaccination or prior exposure. And then, of course, there's the comorbidity question. So if you have a healthy person who gets a contaminated unit with bacteria in it, they'll probably do much better than someone who's on the verge of death anyway. Most bacteria that come from contaminated units are the, the typical skin flora. But most bacteria are microorganisms that kill patients. Number one is Babesia, and number two is Staph aureus. Uh, then it sort of smatters down the list. If you look at the type of blood product that leads to a fatal infectious uh, reaction in the recipient, really it's platelets popping up. Now, granted, that was one really bad year, 
Um, but of course, this is like I said, because they're stored at room temperature. And so if you graph for apheresis platelets in particular, from 2001 until 2013, the number of microbial related fatalities from transfusion, it started off around seven or eight a year and has since gone down. So what changed between, let's say 2004 to 2006 versus 2006 to 2008? The Red Cross and others decided, well, if the skin gets in the needle and you start collecting blood through the line, hopefully that little plug of skin and bacteria will be at the beginning of the blood that you collect. And so they started doing something called a diversion pouch, where the first, whatever, 10, 15 cc's at the most, gets diverted into this little bag and thrown away. And after that, you change the valve here and collect the rest. And the hope is that all the dirty stuff at the beginning sort of doesn't end in, in the recipient product. The other change was to change the amount of sample volume taken for culture. So when platelets are made, a culture is taken, that culture is held for about 12 hours. If there's no growth on the culture, the platelet gets released. Now that culture will be held until the expiration date of the platelet. And if it does turn positive, our blood bank or any other blood bank will get a phone call from the blood supplier saying, hey, don't transfuse that unit. And that all works very well if you didn't transfuse it already. Well, they increased the volume of that initial culture from four to eight mils. And when they did that, the odds ratio for a culture positive unit went to 1.5. And so if you do the calculations um, of a Poisson distribution of bugs sitting in a bag and you sample either four mils or eight mils, the fraction of units detected obviously will go up when you move to eight mils. And if you know the odds ratio, then you can go back and calculate what you think is the colony forming unit concentration per mil in those bags, which they calculated as 0.15. And then with that, you can project, well, what if I sampled 16 mils? The more you sample, the more chance that a very low concentration of organism will end up in that, that culture and then grow. And so if you go up to 16 mils, you get up to around 90% detected. So you're still releasing 10% of the contaminated units thinking that they're totally negative. So then you fast forward. So the, the platelet goes to the hospital. It sits there for three days at room temperature. The bacteria are growing. Now they're not at low concentration anymore. People have done studies where they said, okay, right before you send it to the bedside to transfuse, let's take a sample and culture it. And we've called this active surveillance at the time of issue. If you do this, you detect 32 times more bacterially contaminated platelets. You see a tenfold increase in septic transfusion reactions, meaning that you're, you have symptoms in a patient that otherwise you would have thought were an allergy or some other problem. And now because of your active surveillance, you realize that it was a contaminated culture or contaminated product that went to that patient. Basically, you can calculate the sensitivity of this culture at the time of issue to be around 10 to the 3 CFU per mil. That would detect a little over 90% of the contaminated units. Importantly, most of the severe reactions in recipients occur with concentrations of bacteria greater than 10 to the 5, or as they say, the virulent species. So in summary, the infectious disease risk from transfusion is not... It's bad, but it's not that bad. So we have five reported deaths per year in the US, which is about one in 500,000 platelet recipients. But just to put that in perspective, we estimate the deaths from medical error in this country are around 180 to 400,000 per year. So even though this needs to go down, in the greater context, it's really a small pie. <clears throat> and then of course, Zika came. And our focus on bacteria and whatnot got shifted. And <clears throat> just for people who know, so Zika forest in Uganda. Back in the 1950s, people were doing experiments where they took monkeys, put them in a cage, hung them in the jungle, and waited for them to get sick. And that's how Zika virus was identified. They had a monkey that got sick in the Zika forest of Uganda. It took them a while to identify the virus, uh, and once they did, and they were actually able to do a serology test, they realized that about half the people in that area, and most of Africa, have been exposed to the virus. 
And so the question is, why is it becoming such a problem as it sweeps from you know, the French Polynesia to South America and then up? And one, one possibility is that people who live here are exposed when they're kids. And, and you know, as we know from many viruses, if you're exposed at different times of your life, the symptoms can be very different. Um, the other issue is you have cross-reactivity between dengue antibodies and, and Zika, and that may play a role in disease modulation. The most frightening thing that I've heard is that Zika's codon usage has been shifting to adapt to the tRNA prevalence in humans compared to animals and mosquitoes. For me, that sort of sets off an alarm, which is if you're using a nucleic acid test in the midst of a raging, moving epidemic with an organism that is, has selective pressure on its DNA sequence, you have a potential for serious problem in terms of false negatives. So the Zika epidemic has driven the transfusion world uh, into a panic, essentially. And by the end of 2015, the FDA began issuing guidelines. Those guidelines were revised. And around that time, the FDA said, hey, there's a bunch of technologies out there that are used in other parts of the world that pathogen reduce or pathogen inactivate uh, for blood products. And we actually had a phase four trial that was done in this country. And maybe coincidentally, maybe not, they approved the first product in the United States, which was Intercept by the Cirrus Corporation, right around that time. And so now for the first time, we have the ability not just to detect pathogens in our blood products, but actually kill them or inactivate them. And this was important because they approved this right before they actually approved the IND for the first nucleic acid test for Zika. And there's since been two that have been approved for IND, um, but there still is not a true FDA approval for a Zika test. The recommendations that, that came out, so this is the revised version, just to give you an idea of, of how much we dodged a bullet, uh, potentially. If you have more than one locally acquired Zika case, you have to cease blood collection until testing or pathogen reduction technology is implemented. So basically, Puerto Rico shut down at that point, collecting blood. If you're in an area where local transmission is considered possible, maybe likely, simply because people travel there from endemic areas and there are cases being detected. Now, obviously, you see the, the states that are bordering the areas where Zika was, was sort of spreading person to person or person mosquito to person. Um, but you also have states like New York where people fly in from South America all the time and, and Zika cases pop up. So they basically had four weeks to either stop collecting blood, start testing, or start using pathogen reduction. And the rest of the country had 12 weeks. And that was back in August of last year. So do we need pathogen reduction? Well, we had Zika. Before that, the Europeans had chicken Numga virus back in the 2000s. In 1999, we stumbled on West Nile virus. And of course, we all remember in the 80s, there was HIV. Worldwide, there's about 75 to 90 million units collected a year of blood, and, and most of those are transfused. But around 20, 17 to 20% of them are actually under-tested globally. So in the U.S., we have this long panel of tests that we pay for for every single one of our units of blood. But if you're in Africa, you don't have that. And we are transmitting malaria to pregnant women, to children, and they are dying. So in addition to the whole Zika guidance, the FDA decided, well, maybe this is a good time to come down on bacterial risk control too. So they issued a draft guidance, not a true guidance, for bacterial risk control for platelet transfusion. And it essentially said that this is our draft. We are going to tell you in the true guidance that you need to do pathogen reduction or bacterial testing of platelets intended for transfusion. And not just the same bacterial testing you were doing before, well, if the platelet is less than four days old, meaning, you know, if it's three days old, you're good, but if it's greater than three, you have to do pathogen reduction or additional bacterial testing. And this gets back to the issue where if you do a culture just when you collect, 
you're going to get false negatives because of stochastic issues with sampling, very low concentrations of bacteria. And they said, well, look at this. If you look at the septic transfusion reactions that occur, they're not occurring on day one, two, and three. And that's because if there's a big enough load of bacteria on the day of collection, it's going to turn positive on that initial culture. If it's a small load that produces a false negative culture, it might grow up by day four or five, and that's when we're killing people. And so, you know, the draft guidance is a draft. The point of it is to stimulate discussion and response to the FDA. There have been multiple surveys going out in the community. Hospitals are planning. The American Red Cross is actually just sent a letter back to the FDA discussing its concerns with the draft guidance. And now they are offering pathogen-reduced platelets to their customers. So in terms of pathogen reduction right now in this country, what are our options? Worldwide, there's a few technologies being developed. Um, the only one that's approved in this country is the intercept technology. You use a sorolin compound which intercalates DNA and then you illuminate with UV light. That intercalated compound binds to the DNA and you end up essentially shutting down uh, viability of the organism. There's also a company that has Mirasol, a different compound. This one is a vitamin, which is considered safe for human consumption at all quantities, essentially. Uh, same idea, though. Intercalation, UV illumination, uh, and then binding to nucleic acids. There's another technology from, uh, called Theraflex, and there's two versions of it. One is a very short wavelength UV C, so, so very high energy UV with no photosensitizer. You just blast away and kill everything with UV. Or you add methylene blue and then blast with a longer wavelength. Just as an aside, uh, sorolins, which are used by Intercept, are present in food. And people have come out with multiple studies, this is one of them, showing that if you go down to Florida and you drink orange juice and then you get a sunburn, you have essentially given yourself a photosensitizer and your rate of developing skin cancer goes up. So people who drink 1.5 or more uh, servings a day of citrus juice have a slight increased risk of basal and squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. But non-citrus non -citrus juice doesn't have any effect. So what are these sorolins? Um, they're related to coumarins. Uh, like I mentioned, they intercalate DNA and then they lead to covalent, covalent cross-linking uh, after exposure to UV light. They are known to increase cancer risk, although they have been used as tanning activators uh, for people until around 1996. And, and horrifically, I read that in Asia, uh, people actually use them to fish. So if you ever saw Indiana Jones, or what was it, uh, Crocodile Dundee, where he throws the dynamite in the water and then the fish blow up, fish are like extremely toxic to our... Uh, prone to toxicities from sorolins, and I guess they die rapidly. So you can go to a river, dump a bunch of sorolins in, and all the fish wash up, and then you collect them. The intercept technology uh, uses this machine, uh, which is the UV illuminator. You can fit two bags in it at a time, uh, and you do your illumination in there. Essentially, you collect your platelets, and you collect them in pass, or platelet additive solution. You then transfer it to the illumination bag. You do your illumination. Now, you're, you're going to have all these sorolins and sorolin byproducts floating around in the bag. And to get rid of those, you add, you add your product to a second bag, which has an absorption device that essentially absorbs away most of them. And that's so that you don't cause a reaction in a recipient against the sorolin or photosensitize them. Then you transfer it to the final storage bag, and that goes to your hospital blood bank and gets transfused into a patient. So intercept platelets were approved. They got a CE mark back in 2002. The FDA approval was in 2014. In this country, we've only approved up to a double collection, meaning that when you do the apheresis collection, you can actually collect two platelet products from a single donor. We do collect three platelet products from people who have a high enough platelet count, but right now, Intercept only has approval for doubles. Storage can be up to seven days, although in this country we only have approval for five days. 
which is our current standard, and we add cost. So the cost, off the record I've heard, is about 60 bucks uh, per unit. Good news is that if you take these platelets and you put them into P53 knockout mice, you don't cause cancer. <laughs> and in terms of log reductions, so obviously you hit anything with nucleic acids that the sorolin can get into and bind. And you hit it with around a four to six log reduction. So HIV, greater than six log reduction. Uh, HTLV1, which I don't even think we're testing for is around a four log reduction. You don't really hit the non-enveloped, and that's one issue. <clears throat> and so as you can see, if you take these sort of model viruses that are non-enveloped, some of them you're only getting a one to two log reduction. And the other thing to point out, spores have sort of a weaker reduction. Presumably, the non-enveloped viruses and the spores, the issue is that the DNA is not in a replicative state. It's obviously bound by a lot of DNA binding proteins and probably not available for the sorolin to get into and cross-link. Protozoa, rickettsia, they get hit too. And so what's our experience? These were approved years ago in lots of other parts of the world. And uh, what did they say? So <clears throat> if you go to Belgium, they did a study three years prior to adopting Intercept and then three years after adopting Intercept. And there was essentially no difference in terms of number of platelets transfused per patient, days that patients were transfused with platelets, the platelet dose used, or the red cell use in those patients. What about cost savings? Uh, Jeff McCullough published a paper a couple years ago projecting cost savings. So he said, well, if you can avoid some infectious disease testing, now right now the only thing the FDA lets you avoid is that initial bacterial culture. And the idea is that if you're going to do the photo inactivation or the pathogen reduction, you can just not do that initial culture. In theory, you can not irradiate. And you can not do Babesia testing, which we're paying 25 bucks a red cell unit for. You can not do Dengue testing. You can push your platelet shelf life from five days to seven days. And if you're a normal institution, about 10% of your platelet inventory expires after five days, you paid for that 10% out of your pocket. So this is a real savings, potentially. And they calculated around $141 of savings per unit with a unit added cost of 60 bucks. This makes sense. But what about the real world experience? So people that implemented Intercept between 2008 and 2010, in the real world, they saw an increase in cost. And the reason was, is that they still had to do all their testing. So they had to pay now the extra 60 or so bucks. Um, they saw some decrease in wastage from around 16% to 2%. So if you take that into account, you go from about an 85% increase in cost to around a 71% increase in cost, or around 100 bucks per unit. Um, and this includes labor, um, you know, personnel training, everything that went into bringing up pathogen reduction at this hospital. What it did not include was cost savings from not irradiating, from not doing CMV testing, and from not doing additional bacterial testing. Interestingly, this study did show other potential benefits. So the rate of febrile reactions went down, and the rate of allergic reactions went down. But of course, these platelets are stored in that platelet additive solution, which that may be the real reason for this. In the US, the trial that basically supported the approval of Intercept was called SPRINT. It was a multi-center prospective study. 645 patients were randomized. They all had thrombocytopenia due to production deficiency, and they were followed for about 28 days. They got either Intercept platelets or regular control platelets, and the primary endpoints was essentially severe bleeding. Now, the grade of this, and this is a clinical grading scheme, is just totally complicated and arbitrary, but let's just believe that it's true uh, and valid. The result was there was no difference in this arbitrary clinical grading of bleeding, um, and we say that these pathogen-reduced platelets are not inferior. Great. Uh, except for a couple of problems. So if you look at the platelet count in these patients after platelet transfusion, it was essentially lower in the patients who received the pathogen-reduced intercept platelets. And it was significantly lower. 
Also, the days to the next platelet transfusion was shorter, which makes sense because our trigger for transfusion is typically not bleeding, although in a lot of patients it is, but in most patients it's just platelet count. So if you're not raising the count as much, you're going to transfuse more often. And if you transfuse more often, you're going to get more platelets during the study period. However, the pathogen-reduced platelets in this study were stored in platelet additive solution, where only 30 to 45 percent of it was plasma. There's some data to argue that platelets stored in the solution get activated more than platelets that are stored in 100 percent plasma. And like I mentioned, those activated platelets tend to go places and bind and leave circulation faster. So it's not clear to me whether that decrease in platelet count seen in this study was due to the fact that you're using the additive solution or that you're using pathogen reduction. There was something that was a little more concerning. So when they looked at uh, adverse events, if you look at ARDS in the initial analysis, so in the pathogen-reduced arm, five people are, are essentially had ARDS and none in the control arm. And that was concerning, although, like I mentioned, transfusion-associated circulatory overload, which is volume overload by transfusion, is more common when you transfuse more. So, again, this could all be confounding due to the fact that you're transfusing these people slightly more, or it could be some issue with the product itself going to the lungs, causing inflammation, who knows. Um, there was basically a reanalysis of the data, so they brought in an expert panel to look at all these patients and to decide, is it ARDS, is it pneumonitis, is it some other issue, is it acute lung injury? And after they did the reanalysis, they convinced themselves that they're no longer statistically significant in terms of the difference, which you usually would say, well, that's kind of phony. But actually, if you took 327 patients in this hospital who are receiving platelet transfusions, for thrombocytopenia. I would be shocked if zero of them had any ARDS over a course of the month. These are all neutropenic patients. These are all patients who are extremely prone to volume overload. And so to be honest with you, I would tend to believe this as opposed to a zero on that control arm. They also looked at deaths among patients with uh, serious pulmonary adverse events. And, and basically there was no statistical significance, except instead of ARDS, there was this maybe uh, increase in acute lung injury, and I think this was a, a reclassification issue, um, but who knows. So basically the FDA approved Intercept, but said, wait, we're going to do a phase four trial. And the phase four trial is going to look at specifically whether patients get intubated or end up with a tight-fitting O2 mask. And this was really in response to the question of what is up with this acute lung injury or ARDS in the SPRINT trial. This trial is just beginning. We are a site uh, that's enrolling patients, and it'll be very interesting to see what happens. Another issue with Intercept is that you use sorolins. So if you have a hypersensitivity to sorolins, uh, that's not good because not all of them get absorbed away uh, by the absorption step. The other issue, which actually isn't really an issue in this country, is that if you're a baby who's getting phototherapy for elevated bilirubin, you don't want to give a baby a photosensitizer uh, and then put them under bright lights. And so there's cutoffs in terms of the light wavelength that we're giving patients, uh, and so you, know, you have to be above those thresholds. The good news is that apparently all of the phototherapy devices in this country are. So what else is there? The other technology that's sort of nearing the end of the pipeline is called Mirasol. Uh, similar idea. So you collect the platelet, <clears throat> you put it in an illumination bag. Now instead of a sorolin, you add riboflavin. And the riboflavin is the photosensitizer. And then you put it in a box, which is essentially a light with a timer, just like with Intercept. Uh, and six to 10 minutes later, boop, it's done. And now you're ready for five day storage. You can do this in plasma or platelet additive solution. <clears throat> it's not approved in the U.S., but <clears throat> the Secretary for Preparedness and Response has decided that this is worthy of funding, and so there was an initial disbursement of $17 million to begin a trial 
of mirror salt platelets in plasma, clinical trial, somehow that turned into an acronym called MyPlate. Um, MyPlate is looking at standard platelets in plasma versus mirror salt treated platelets in plasma. It's involving 15 hospitals or so. Uh, they're hoping for 556 patients and it'll probably take around three and a half years. Initial enrollment has just begun um, and also here in Minnesota, uh, Memorial Blood Center is supplying probably about half of the platelets that are going to seven or eight of the hospitals in this study across the country. Um, in an in a act of planning that I would not agree with, they decided instead of taking the control platelets also from Memorial Blood Center and shipping them overnight all over the country, they're going to take the control platelets from the local suppliers, which in many cases is the American Red Cross, and not ship them across the country, but whatever. Um, and so what other trials have been done and what have they told us? Just to quickly summarize a bunch of data, the rates of platelet aluminization might be lower with pathogen-reduced platelets for reasons that are not entirely clear. Um, and these studies were done using the mirror salt technology. What I've seen argues that white cell killing and inactivation is actually better with intercept compared to current irradiation. And the idea here is we irradiate to kill T cells in the product to prevent T cells from going into a recipient who's immunodeficient and causing transfusion associated graft versus host disease, which depending on what you believe is fatal in anywhere from 50 to 100% of cases. What we do know, unfortunately, is that all of these technologies alter platelet surface proteins and platelets do have RNA and it does also get destroyed by these processes. So how else can you satisfy the FDA draft guidance in terms of bacteria but not pathogen reduce? So one thing you can do is say, well, I'm just going to transfuse platelets that are uh, less than four days old. And if you are HCMC that has a wonderful relationship with Memorial Blood Center, you can try to coordinate your inventory so you only transfuse platelets on day two or three. That would be great. You can use a system developed by a company called Virax, which is a lateral flow immunoassay that is distributed by Fenwell. It costs about $60 a pop. Uh, it is the, uh, supposedly the only rapid test for bacterial contamination. It does detect aerobic and anaerobic bacteria. It is done near the point of issue. So you do this test and you transfuse within 24 hours. And then again, the idea is at that point, the concentration of bacteria is higher than it may have been way back when you collected and did your initial culture. The Virax clinical trial looked at 27,000 apheresis units. Interestingly, nine units that were culture negative initially were posited by Virax near the point of issue, which is promising. They argue 99% specificity, and luckily you only need about 500 microliter sample size. Uh, it does take time, and it takes time in your blood bank. So the staff here, for instance, would have to spend 30 minutes to an hour running this, and you have to run it every 24 hours uh, before you issue. So you could run it at the beginning of day four, issue platelets on day four, but if anything doesn't get issued, you have to run it again and pay another 60 bucks at the beginning of day five. There are some caveats. So three contaminated units in this trial, two of which were deemed significant, were negative by this test, and it has a false positive rate. A false positive rate costs you inventory and it costs you money. But basically, this is the model. Platelets arrive on day two, transfuse. Day three, transfuse. And day four to seven, you do Virax in the morning and then you transfuse for the rest of the day. Immunetics has a different assay. It's a protein that binds to peptoglycan and then becomes active. It then basically enzymatically activates a photo substrate, which leads to a chromogenic change, which is detected by their machine. Um, you can run up to eight samples at a time. It still takes about 30 minutes. And it does have a lower load of detection issue. So like Virax, the idea is that you do this test near the time of issue. Uh, and again, you have very good specificity, but who knows? The other thing you can do is repeat your culture. So you collect your platelet, you do a culture, you send it to the hospital. At day four, the hospital says, okay, I'm gonna do a new culture. And now if the CFUs are higher, this new culture should be positive. 
The problem is you have to then hold your platelet, wait for that culture to grow for about 12 hours before you issue your platelet, and that's essentially because you have to see if it's going to turn positive. Um, but you can extend the platelet for up to two days, and one of the advantages of this method is that it's actually cheap. So you're talking 20 to 30 bucks for a culture bottle and maintaining a culture machine. Just very quickly, so I mentioned these two technologies. Both of these companies are also using their technology for plasma. In addition, there's an Austrian company called Octopharma, which has a product. It's a solvent detergent pooled plasma, which is pathogen inactivated. And Theraflex, I had mentioned, uh, which is the direct UV or the methylene blue and then UV technology. So intercept plasma is very similar to the intercept platelets. The idea is you collect plasma, you add the serolin, you illuminate, you absorb, and then you basically aliquot into little plasma bags. Mirasol plasma is essentially the same, except you're using riboflavin. The solvent detergent treatment from Octopharma, it's a non-ionic detergent that disrupts lipid membranes. So specifically, you're going to hit enveloped viruses, but not non-enveloped viruses. And it can only be used to treat plasma. We approved Octoplas. Um, it's actually a pooled product. And so one of the advantages is, we think, that if you have an allergy against an allergen that a single donor might have, if you pool a thousand donors, the concentration of that allergen goes down, and so theoretically the rate of allergic transfusion reactions is lower. There's also a lot of stuff that the company does. So not only does it add this non-ionic detergent, but it has multiple extraction steps to try to get the detergent off. And because you're pooling so many different people's plasma, there's a concern of variant creutzfeldt jakob disease. So there's a couple of steps involving affinity ligands to remove potential prion proteins. So who knows what's going on with this product in terms of why we see lower allergic reaction rates. But in any event, it's there, it's out there, um, but just for plasma. What about red cells? Well, the unfortunate thing about red cells is that they have hemoglobin and hemoglobin absorbs light in the area that we're using to inactivate the platelets in plasma. But there's some technologies that can handle it. So Cirrus is developing a technology and it's an alkylating agent that's <coughs> light independent. And Mirasol uh, from Terumo claims to have a system to overcome hemoglobin's absorption and actually be able to inactivate whole blood, uh, which I think is in the early planning phases of trials in Africa. So if you are a hospital transfusion service, what do you do now? And I think it depends. So you have to consider whether there's an existence of a viral epidemic with unreliable testing, or whether you think there's a threat of a viral epidemic with unreliable testing. How concerned are you for Babesia? Right now we have a test that's in IND, which probably works pretty well, but you can have very few organisms transmit Babesia. And how concerned are you for West Nile? Right now we do nucleic acid testing. It's not 100% at preventing West Nile transmission. If you worry that pathogen inactivation decreases the efficacy of platelets, then you might ask yourself, how many trauma patients are you treating? How many people are receiving your platelets that need them to work quickly and presumably need to have a quick rise in their platelet count? A lot of the technologies, uh, aside from pathogen reduction, require work in your blood bank. And so how much workflow inertia do you have and how much flexibility do you have in terms of your staff? Then, of course, is the question of how fresh is your inventory and, and how, well, I don't want to say good, but how quick can your blood supplier get you platelets and replenish your stocks if your three-day-old platelets are, are all gone? And then, as always, there's the issue of money. And I just wanted to share with you at the end the Red Cross response to the FDA draft guidance. So when you do the manufacture of intercept platelets, and this is true for all the pathogen reduction technologies, you can't use the triple collections at this point. So you're, you're cutting your number of products down by going just to doubles. Those double collections then go through the process, and at multiple points there have to be a certain number of platelets in the product in a certain volume. If it's before the pathogen inactivation step, you can, of course, divert the product off to be a non-pathogen inactivated product if it doesn't satisfy those criteria. But if it's after the pathogen inactivation step, 
that you fall out of the this specified range, now you've essentially wasted a product. And it's that in combination with workflow issues at the blood suppliers that has made people worry that it might be prudent to come up with a way to make fewer platelets go further. And one way that I really like uh, is to lower the minimum content of a prophylactic dose. So instead of giving a patient with a platelet count of 9,000 who's not bleeding a full apheresis bag, why not give them half? And then just check their platelet count. Sometimes that half will lead to a significant bump in their platelets, and they'll be fine. The other thing that the Red Cross is, is hoping for is expedited approval of the triple uh, illumination bag uh, for the Intercept product, and it is approved in Europe. And then, of course, they want the FDA to take into account the impact on transfusion services in terms of inventory management. So if you, if you go with the HCMC model and you try to transfuse everything by three days, now you're saying that your platelets expire after three days. Is that what you enter into your FDA lockdown computer system? No one has any idea. If you're going to do a testing model where after three days you test, well, how do you control whether a platelet has been tested or not? Do you have to expire it and then unexpire it in your computer system? We're, we're sort of lagging behind in terms of inventory management and outdating record keeping. And so in conclusion, Pathogen reduction is available now in the United States for platelets and plasma. Red cells and whole blood are undergoing clinical trials, and the widespread adoption will depend on a number of factors, risk-benefit analysis, cost, FDA, and regulatory pressure. And that's it. If anyone has any questions... Platelets after pathogen inactivation mm -hmm. is a little bit different than evaluating red cells and plasma and cryoprecipitate because you can evaluate plasma and red cells and cryoprecipitate by looking at what's going on in the blood. The reality with platelets is we don't care how many platelets there are in the blood. Platelets are non-functional basically when they're in the, when they're in the blood. Their functionality is when they get to a site of bleeding. And the reality is we do not have a good way of evaluating the functionality of platelets after you add all these things. Would you comment on that? I absolutely agree with you. The trials that have been done, the best way right now to evaluate what you're talking about is to look at the number of red cells transfused as a proxy for platelet function. That's ridiculous. I, I agree. But, but that's the best we've got. Okay. Now, we are actually about to submit a proposal to do a study. So patients who have severe thrombocytopenia, once you get below 10,000, once you get below 5,000, almost all of them end up with mucosal bleeding. Sure. And right now we test that by stool guaiac. Stool guaiac is great in a sense because it looks at any bleeding that's occurred in the last week maybe. Now, it's bad if you have someone who eats steak because it's going to be positive. The problem with stool guaiac at looking at platelet function is if you give a dose of platelets to someone who's guaiac positive, they're not going to turn negative. What we want to do is test saliva. So if you go up to the bone marrow transplant ward and you ask patients who have oral bleeding that's not visible, how are you doing? What do you, you, you have any problems with your taste? They'll tell you, oh, I, I have a metallic taste. I taste metal. And what they're tasting is low-level mucosal bleeding in their mouth. So what, what Claudia and I would like to do is essentially a clinical trial looking pre- and post-platelet transfusion at the content of blood in saliva. And there's a few clever ways, I, I think they're clever, that, uh, that we can do that. Um, but hopefully, because you can swoosh the mouth and clean it out and then say, okay, let's reset it down to zero and then give a platelet transfusion and then two hours later come back and say, okay, what's the amount of blood in your saliva? So I totally agree with you. I'm about to submit a proposal uh, to a journal this week. So. Great. Yeah. Uh, two questions. Uh, one is uh, on the, uh, instead of using cultures, is there any possibility for molecular techniques 
Yeah, so I think for the initial culture that happens right after collection, you're still running into a, a physical stochastic issue where if you sample 5 mils, 8 mils, 15 mils, if the CFU concentration is 0.1 CFUs per mil, and if CFU means DNA copy number, which it doesn't exactly, but there's a chance you'll just miss it because what you pulled off just doesn't have any ligand in it. Um, for the, the sort of right before transfusion step, I haven't seen any that's approved. Um, everything I've seen, like I mentioned, is, is either antibody-based or protein binding to peptidoglycan and then an enzymatic reaction. Um, time for maybe one or two more questions. I, I don't know of any. Um, you know, yeah, a lot of these studies, and, and the sprint trial suffered from it, because the field is moving so fast, um, and I didn't even get into the fact that there are papers looking at the different collection platforms, so if you collect on the amicus versus the other device, there's differences in the average post-transfusion increase in platelet number for reasons that no one has any idea, whether it's like one machine beats them up more than the other. So I agree, we're doing large prospective randomized trials with poor controls um, and poor assays of efficacy. But that's what we've got. Bench studies have been done, but no clinical. Anybody study those little throwaway bags? Yeah. 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 Yeah.